Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Periodic Table of History, where we study history in four dimensions. And we're going to take a look at Herodotus today. Herodotus is somebody I've always heard about, and he is given the title, the father of history. It somewhat bothered me that Herodotus is given that title, but the academic explanation is that he went traveling and therefore gave us different perspectives on history from the different civilizations involved. Like, he is most notably worried about Greece and Persia and the conflicts therein. And then he goes to Egypt at one time, talks to the high priests there, almost like a traveler would, just like a traveling blogger would that's going around the world and going to maybe the academic high places and, and getting information. So he would get from Egypt that knows something about Israel and Persia. And then he'd go up into Turkey and they know something about Syria and Babylon, so on and so forth. So he would drew his work with various stories that are actually quite interesting. And because they're so varied, they actually make for a very good read, uh, a very engaging read. It's not just like a really dry history book, but uh, because he is on a travel, because he travels around the, the Mediterranean here, he's getting perspectives from different storytellers from all over. I can buy that just a little bit. And anyway, I wanted to delve into his work. He lived around 484 to 425 BC, which is about the end time of the Old Testament. But he is working, trying to understand his world, and he goes into the past. He goes down to the time of Hezekiah. He went through an interesting time of the Greco-Persian Wars, and look at his location here. We'll look at it on the map. So I'll zoom in here. Helicarnassus is over here on the southwest part of Turkey, and it happens to be a Greek settler ship. And we know from the previous videos that this is where Lydia is, and Lydia is also a Shemitic area that's embedded in between all these other Greek states. But Turkey is a hard place to hold on to unless you have an army over here in the, the tip part of Iraq and Syria. It's really a very hard place to defend. You have to have a navy and an army and so on. So, so it gets overrun back and forth and that has happened many times during the millennia. So Greece has a lot of its Greek-speaking people over here in West Turkey, but you also have this Shemitic influence over here. And then you have other Shemitic influences that would be going into the Elamite tribe, which becomes Persia. And also, we're, this video is going to cover like Assyria, Chaldea, which are also Shemitic tribes. Those are from Asher, a son of Shem, and Arphaxad, son of Shem. And so the, these guys, we, we also get into one of the sons of Ham and a very prominent king, Taharka of, of Egypt or Ethiopia, also Nubia. This is an interesting place to get trapped up in. If you were born in Helicarnassus, then you would have seen the Persians overrun you. And then the Greeks try to come back and the Persians try to overrun you again. You would have to balance as an individual so that you could live through this and try to ally yourself with a certain force so you don't get killed as you can see here he's right there in the middle of this so that becomes really interesting so let's go to the bible now because herodotus writes about the time of hezekiah but he writes as a traveler that has gone along the mediterranean down to egypt so he's going to get their perspective so i'm going to start off with the Hebrews perspective, because that's where I start with anyway. Anybody that's a Bible scholar can get a tremendous overview of history just knowing the Bible, because it's the core of everything else. So when we're talking about Hezekiah, there are chapters in Isaiah and 2 Kings that give us the story, which is uh, quite detailed. And so we can go over here to 2 Kings 18. It says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And you can read that as we go. You can always pause the video and read 
things that I put on the screen. Uh, but this ends up being an interesting time. I'm going to zoom out here so that we can get a different perspective. And I'm going to uh, take the Persians off and go back in time to the Assyrians. We'll go to Tiglath-Pileser, Shalmaneser, also Sargon, and Sennacherib, because Sennacherib is, is the focal point of this story from an antagonistic perspective. We can see here that, let me overlay, uh, when we go back in time to Tiglath-Pileser, uh, this is the extent of the Assyrian Empire. And see, that's bumping up against Judah. Let's, let's put Judah. And, and we know that Israel was overrun. Israel is to the north of Judah, and Israel was overrun. We can see why that is, because this most fertile land goes across from the Persian Gulf, and then it goes up around to Syria, because when you, you know, the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, are making this area fertile, and then and when you go over to the Mediterranean, that's going to make the area fertile. So when you get to Lebanon by the Mediterranean, you get the cedars of Lebanon. And then if you go more south, you get into northern Israel and into Judah. So this whole area is very prime. That would be desired by a conquering king, which in this case, uh, Tiglath-Pileser. So that's the core of the Assyrian Empire, and it crosses over, I think, into Chaldea a little bit. Chaldea is known by, uh, was Akkadia, which turned into Chaldea, and then it's known by its city called, called Babylon, which is right here uh, by the Persian Gulf and up into the Euphrates a bit, northwest of the Persian Gulf. So those are uh, uh, noteworthy to see their, their proximity is very, is going to bring them in conflict. But when we get to Sargon II, the Assyrian Empire, it, it expands. And it's going to be looking at a lot of these other, these other kingdoms that are around as well. See, Chaldea is about right here where the yellow is. We have Elam, another son of Shem over here in the south. East, we have the Medes, one of the sons of Japheth over here in the east of Assyria. Edom is a little bit south. It's famous for the city of Petra, south of Israel, and it's another buffer state between Assyria and Egypt. And Egypt and Assyria, I think they liked the situation because they could use these center countries, these center civilization as buffer states for them. But if any of the groups get greedy like Sennacherib, then they're going to overrun these, these other smaller states. And Hezekiah right here in Judah is having this problem now with Sennacherib, who lived from about 705 to 681 BC. So let's go to our periodic table of history. When we're looking at the different civilizations here, we're looking at Greece, then we're looking at Israel, and we are looking at the Middle Eastern kingdoms because we have Assyria, Chaldea, the Medes, and the Persians. And those are offshoots of these Akkadian empires that were around right after the flood. So I'll put an arrow down here at about Herodotus' time. That's going to be, well, about 400, maybe let's just say 450 B.C. in Greece. And then we're talking about Israel right in here. We're talking about these kingdoms that are always coming in conflict with each other right in here. And you can see when we zoom in to the Assyrian Empire, we have Shalmaneser plus Sargon, we have Sargon too, and then we have Sennacherib right here, right bumped up against the Chaldeans. So they knew of each other. They were just separate kingdoms that fought for supremacy. And Assyria was actually a very incredibly sustaining civilization up until this time. You can see when we zoom out that Assyria lasted just about till after the flood all the way down to Sennacherib. So that was a very long-lasting civilization. A very long-lasting civilization. Now let's get rid of some of this noise. So in 2 Kings we see that Salmanazar, king of Assyria, 
deported a bunch of the northern tribes, and I guess in this case, the scripture tells us Samaria, and Samaria is uh, directly north of Judah. So the northern kingdom fell, and then Samaria, and now Sennacherib is knocking on the door of Hezekiah. Fast forward just a little bit in years, and in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. So now we have the king of Assyria imposing a tax, which Hezekiah does pay. And he has to even take some gold out of the temple to pay this tax. So we see how things are going. They're not going very well. In 2 Kings 18, we have the captain of the guard threatening Hezekiah. That's Rabshakeh. It says, He stood and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Hear the words of great king, the king of Assyria. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? We have the dialogue recorded here in an eyewitness account from Hezekiah, looking on at the Assyrian army outside the walls of Jerusalem, and Hezekiah being inside the walls of Jerusalem. And keep in mind that this is happening about 700 BC, so we can think of it as being about 1,700 years ago, and it's always fascinated me that we have dialogue from people from ancient times. And we see this dialogue in the book of Second Kings. It is amazing. It's just anybody that studies this just has access to this instantly. So Isaiah has a dialogue to Hezekiah. Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. See, so God is taking this as, as direct blasphemy against the living God. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Then in 2 Kings 19, verse 9, And when he heard say of Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, Behold, he has come out to fight against thee. He sent messengers again unto Hezekiah. And it goes on, and you can read that. That's really interesting there, too, because we have this other king, Tirhaka. In secular Latinized literature, we have Taharka here, 690 to 664 BC. He is thought of as a, a very high-ranking king of the Africans because he withheld one of the attacks of the Assyrians. Here is the Egyptian line, so Taharka is going to be in here. So here is Taharka of the Egyptian line, who is also thought of as Nubian and Ethiopian. And let me put a bigger arrow there. So he's held in high esteem as an African king. So we have different kings, Shabaka from 721 to 707, then Shabitku, and then Taharka reigned from 690 to 664 BC. Then Neko I is significant. Tantamani and Neko II down in 610 to 595. But this Taharka is the one that is most interesting right here because now we can see the names of the people that are having it out at each other. And you can see Hezekiah right here in the middle. Taharka, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib. And they're about to come smack face to face with power right here in the middle. We see the mirrored text in Isaiah 37. 6 to 14, and it's really similar to that uh, Second Kings reference. There are various paintings and depictions of this very fascinating event, and you can see some of them here. And also take note that Hezekiah was pleading before God, and he was being proactive. He had Hezekiah's water tunnel. It's called the Siloam Pool. It's a tunnel that comes out at the Siloam Pool, and there's a picture of it. This was a tunnel that Hezekiah was using so his people could still have water and undergo the siege. Well, the defeat is found in 2 Kings 19. When you read down after verse 34 and a little bit past there, uh, here it is in Hebrew and here it is in English. God says, this is the living God, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand 
And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nishrash, his god, that Adremelech and Sherezer, his son, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Esaradon, his son, reigned in his stead. Isn't that incredible? So Sennacherib, boom, is bombinosed out of there. So you can see there's a picture of these events, very popular events. And we've had a lot of time for artists to depict the events. He is gone. We can go back to the periodic table of history and we can see Esaradon in here. So there is Sennacherib, and there is Esaradon, his successor. And if we go down, they don't last much longer. We see the demise there in about 612 BC. So this great empire insults the living God, and then their empire is gone. Taken over by here, we see the Medes in the orange and the Chaldeans, or Babylonians, in the yellow. Let's go to Herodotus because this is the, the interesting thing. We can look at his depiction of what the Egyptians told him. Now remember, the Egyptians are down here and they did not see this. They did not witness it with their own eyes. They got hearsay from it. And then they are telling Herodotus later this story. And this is so fun to cross-reference then the Bible and getting into the Gentile history and seeing how it crosses over. And I do believe in one living God. Most of the other civilizations do not, and so you can see these other, when they say gods that they are putting trust in, they are talking about the false gods. Now let's read how Herodotus scripts this story. So presently came King Sennacherib against Egypt. See, it says against Egypt, not against Hezekiah, see? And with a great host of Arabians and Assyrians, and the warrior Egyptians would not march against him. The priests in the quandary went into the temple shrine and there bewailed to the God's image the peril which threatened him. Now when he talks about gods there, he would be talking about a false god in my estimation. But this is still what the text of Herodotus is giving us. So in his lamentation, he fell asleep and dreamed that he saw the God standing over him and bidding him to take courage, for he should suffer no ill by encountering the host of Arabia. Myself, said the God, will send you champions. So he trusted the vision and encamped at Pelusium with such Egyptians as would follow him. For here is the road into Egypt, and none of the warriors would go with him, but only hucksters and artificers and traders. Their enemies too came thither, and one night, here's the key, and one night a multitude of field mice swarmed over the Assyrian camp and devoured their quivers and their bows and their handles of their shields. Likewise, insomuch that they fled the next day unarmed, and many fell. And at this day a stone statue of the Egyptian king stands in Hephaestus' temple with a mouse in his hand, and an inscription to the effect, Look on me and fear the gods. Well, I will definitely not fear those gods, but I will fear the living God. So we can look at the text in Hezekiah and just realize that we have high resolution detail on this event that the Egyptians have recorded. And it also occurs to me that uh, the living God can fight on behalf of his people and other nations can be blessed Sargon II died 705, Sennacherib died 681, then the 600s become the demise of the Assyrian Empire, and we start having these other empires around them getting stronger. Taharqa in Africa, see there's a statue of him, becomes this icon of repulsion to imperialistic forces, and then Chaldea starts to become a bigger player as well. So Hezekiah puts his trust in the living God and that prolongs the nation and stabilizes this region. A little bit later we get into the time of Jeremiah and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. 
and then we're starting to get into the fall of Jerusalem, and that is because of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is Chaldean Babylonian. We can look back to the periodic table of history, these civilization lines, and we can see Nebuchadnezzar here, 605 to 562 BC. In their language, Nebuchadnezzar Usur II, the time of Daniel. So now we get into another book of the Bible. See, and this is getting closer to the time of Herodotus, because now Daniel is in the 600s going into the 500s. Nebuchadnezzar defeated this Neko II. So we see this gradual taking over of the Middle Kingdoms into Egypt. The African kingdoms then, uh, I say, pushed down into Ethiopia, more concentrated. But Egypt, this Nile Delta area of Egypt, is extraordinarily strategic for trade. So that is a, a great loss for Africa. So let's fast forward a little bit. We changed the map a little bit. Now we have the center of focus that goes a little bit more east to the Chaldees or Babylonians. And that's with Nebuchadnezzar, you can see here. And then this is the same time as Pythagoras. So when we're trying to weave this story together, you've probably heard of the Pythagorean theorem. Well, Pythagoras was a Greek that lived from 570 to 495 BC. So when you think about this, just, just think about um, Daniel of the Magi and Pythagoras were contemporaries. And that's something that just floors me. There's all sorts of connections like that when you look into the periodic table of history. Amazing. So we start to see Greek philosophy forming through Pythagoras. And he started the Pythagoreans, which is a philosophical sector. And so when we're looking at the history just before Herodotus, we come to Babylon. And Herodotus writes about this, as well as we know of the stories in the Bible. They're quite popular because we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, da Daniel, and Lion's Den, the writing on the wall. So that's applicable here. The, the writing on the wall is the Belshazzar story. So Nebuchadnezzar put down the Judean. So Jehoiakim, he's out in Israel. We have Zedekiah, he's out. They actually killed his children right before him. So the end of Israel having its own land is right here at 586. So Nebuchadnezzar is a pivotal figure in the balance of history. And there's a depiction of, of that. There's Pythagoras and Daniel as contemporaries, and Herodotus has this to say. You just see these little jewels that are strewn throughout his writing. And so we get some bits of details that kind of tag along the timeline that is built in the Bible. Daniel's very amazing, talking about the Magi. We end up with Daniel being promoted to very high offices, but we can see that the Babylonians or Chaldeans made the same mistake as the Assyrians. They did not recognize the living God. They just thought that the God of Israel was the same as all the other gods. It's just a machine to control the people, not thinking that, no, there is an actual living God. So we have the story of the writing on the wall, and we are very familiar with that in the Bible, and we see the character Belshazzar, a contemporary of Nabonidus, 556 to 539. Well, we also have Belshazzar on Nabonidus cylinder. So there is Nabonidus cylinder. So Belshazzar is in two places there. It's there in the archaeology, and it's there in the Bible. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousands. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. We go down to verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall and the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So there's that famous writing on the wall. And this is one of my all-time favorite scriptures. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts did trouble him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. 
I can render this picture very well of a king having his knees smiting one against another. Well, that's all very fine and dandy, but when we go to Herodotus, we have the military tactics that Cyrus used against Babylon. So here are the words of Herodotus talking about that same event, but he's getting the information from the Persian side. So this is Cyrus the Great. Remember the Medo-Persian Empire. Well, let's put Persia back on here. The Medes are on here. And so we have the Elamites. Remember the Elamites are one of the sons of Shem. So these are really just a bunch of brothers that are fighting each other. And then you have the cousins over here. When they get to the Greeks and they get to the Africans, they're, they're getting to their cousins and fighting with them. But here Elam becomes Persia, and Elam, the first son of Shem, is now combining with the son of Japheth, Medes, against the Babylonians. See their proximity? Of course they're going to have problems because this is just the way it is. Somebody says, hey, you have to pay me tax. They say, no, well, we're going to kill you. Somebody wins the fight, and somebody pays taxes to somebody else. That's how it works. And so here is Babylonia taking over the Assyrian Empire, which has grown, and then Persia combining with Medes and subsuming the Babylonian Assyrian Empire now. Now when you consume these other empires, you adopt all their problems. So yippee-doo, you won the war. <laughs> Now you have to fight Egypt. Now you have to fight the Greeks. Now you have to fight the Scythians. Now you have to fight the Indians. See how this works. But anyway, this battle here of Cyrus trying to become dominant, Harpagus then made havoc of Lower Asia and the upper country. Cyrus himself subdued every nation, leaving none untouched. Of the greater part of these, I will say nothing, but will speak only of those which gave Cyrus most trouble and are worthiest to be described. When Cyrus had brought all the mainland under his sway, he attacked the Assyrians. There are in Assyria many other great cities, but the most famous and the strongest was Babylon. Now remember, this is Assyria, Babylon, because they're hardly distinct since they have grown, they have overgrown each other. So we get the detail of parting of the canals, Cyrus's march, and then we have some detail here even about how Cyrus overthrows Babylon. He posted his army at the place where the river enters the city and another part of it where the stream issues from the city and bade his men enter the city by the channel of the Euphrates when they should see it to be fordable. And you can read that. Just pause the video and read on. The Persians who were posted with this intent made their way into Babylon by the channel of the Euphrates, which had now sunk about the height of the middle of a man's thigh. And take note of this. All this time, talking about the Babylonians, they were dancing and making merry at a festival which chanced to be toward till they learned the truth, but too well. Yep, they learned the truth too late. Thus was Babylon then for the first time taken. And look at the wealth that the Persians acquired. Look down lower, Herodotus has these details. It says, thus the wealth of Assyria is one-third of the whole wealth of Asia. So when we zoom out on the known world, of all the money that's transferred in what they knew of the world, a third of it was in Babylon. wah -ha. How? Wow. Those are the kind of jewels of detail that we pick up by Herodotus. Let's look in Herodotus again because we have the uh, Magi here. Uh, Herodotus talks about the Magi. And remember, that's where we get our word magician from. The Median tribes are these. The Busei, the Peritaini, the Strucates, the Erizanti, the Budi, and the Magi. So many are their tribes. So when we say that Daniel was of the chief magicians, remember he was deported into that. Well, Daniel ends up talking to Cyrus the Great here of Medo-Persia, and Daniel reads him a passage from Isaiah. In Isaiah 45, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the lions of kings to open before him the two-leaved 
gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked place straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. So wouldn't you have liked to have been there to see the look on Cyrus the Great's face when Daniel reads him the portion of Isaiah from a couple hundred years before that time. That's how you know the living God can give us messages in time and outside of time. So this Medo-Persian Empire turns into the Great Persian Empire. And you can see it there how he expands. He just goes right back with his army through all these cities that have been subjugated and says, hey, do you want to keep on paying taxes to me or you want to die? And they say, hey, we'll just pay taxes to you. Not a big deal. And look at what happens here when we zoom out. Now the world is getting smaller, so to speak. Now we have the Scythians, the Indians, the Ethiopians, and the Grecians that are being bumped into. That's why Herodotus is so interested in this subject. Uh, we have a little bit of the tactics of how Cyrus subjugated the people. Uh, what he did was forbid them to possess weapons and then commanded them to wear tunics under their cloaks and they could learn the lyre. That way they'd make songs and they would not make war. A very interesting tactic. Let your ears buzz when anybody says that they would really like you to be disarmed. Beware the person that tells you they want to disarm you. We see this tactic written about in about 440 BC by Herodotus. Now we see, um, we see Cyrus the Great being talked about as a Mede and a Persian. Cyrus the Great overcomes Astyages of the Medes, and so the Mede Empire that was here is now consumed into the Persian Empire. So it's really Cyrus the Great of Persia. Here's Astyages being worried about Cyrus the Great as a baby, and uh, some of that is talked about in Herodotus. You can read books one and two if you so desire or so inclined. And then here is Astyages as an older man that's coming before Cyrus the Great. Another picture. Well, Herodotus talks about the end of Cyrus, and here's a few clips of Herodotus that you can read, talking about their spears and their daggers, and Cyrus and the demise of Cyrus. All good things or bad things, whatever you'd like to see, they come to an end. Cyrus the Great died. Herodotus gives us the story of this great queen, Tamiris. So let's venture into that because that covers Herodotus and Cyrus the Great is listed in the Bible. So it's a piece of information that we can get external of the Bible that impacts our secular history. The Masagadi are here to the east of the Caspian Sea and a little to the north of Parthia and Persia. And notice the name up here, the Yansai. This is the Chinese name for the Masagati because we're starting to get into the point you know, 400s, it's a little bit early, but when you get into about the 300s, 200s, the Chinese are making their way across the Silk Road, across this Gobi Desert, discovering these middle countries, these middle people groups. And so they start coming up with their own names of these people, which is astonishing because now we, we're starting to see a, a worldwide ability to encapsulate history. And the Masagati, they do a migration a little bit later and become the Alans, supposedly, which make a big conquest into Middle Europe, and they are one of the progenitors of the Germans. But anyway, these people over here that are in kind of around Kazakhstan, I'd say, they are given Cyrus some problems, or, you know, maybe Cyrus is just a conqueror and wants to get up there. There's a really interesting story Herodotus writes that down, talks about Cyrus going to invade. Cyrus has lots of wealth and decides what they'll do is put a bunch of wine and drugs out there, wine and marijuana, and they'll flee from it, get the army of the Masagati to come down, prey upon that, get drunk, get drugged, and then Cyrus the Great 
though pretending to retreat out, would now come back up and conquer that army. And that is something that he did. He kills, Cyrus kills a third of the Masagati army that is led by Spargapasus. Now, he survives Cyrus killing one-third of his army because they got drunk and drugged. Uh, but when he wakes up from his drunken, drugged state, he commits suicide, which causes his mom, Tamaris, Queen Tamaris, to get really angry. So she goes all out. She goes straight down in fury and actually kills Cyrus the Great. So this is the end of Cyrus the Great that we don't see in the Bible. We do see in this secular history, which is just fabulous. Thus we see that Herodotus lends to our understanding an amazing detail that is a little bit removed from the Hebrew record. And thus, when we go to our periodic table of history, we can see that Cyrus the Great has his end in 529 BC. And this ushers in the Achaemenid dynasty, and that's also known as the Persian dynasty, the actual Persian empire that's set up now. But keep in mind, uh, this is the time of Daniel. You also have the uh, time of Ezra in the Bible. We're getting the proclamation in the 539s to Jews to return to Jerusalem because they're trying to regain their nationality. But they're regaining their nationality uh, within the confines of the Persian Empire. I hope you really enjoyed that. I'll do a little bit of an intermission here, and I want to keep on talking about this maybe in a second part.